Good evening, everybody. Welcome again to um, ICA webinars, the Wednesday academic program uh, hosted by Indian College of Anesthesiologists. Today's topic is COVID-19, how to bell COVID-19. We have uh, two excellent speakers. And to introduce the excellent speakers and to conduct the proceedings, we have very senior faculty as uh, moderators for today's session who doesn't need a special introduction. Uh, Dr. A.S. Kameshwar Rao uh, from um, Senior Consultant and Professor uh, Kims Amalapuram and uh, Professor Dr. Beljit Singh from New Delhi. It's over to the moderators to check the dais. I think uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan is joining now. We'll get his opening remarks and proceed with the webinar. Good evening, sir. Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, I appreciate uh, the Indian College of Anesthesiologists for uh, conducting excellent uh, uh, webinars every week. Very useful for the, all the practicing anesthesiologists as well as for the postgraduates. And uh, today, very important topics and very useful topics are selected in this webinar. And uh, first speaker, is Dr. Jose Chaco, who is working as a senior consultant in critical care at Narayana Healthcare, Bangalore. He has got a vast experience of more than 25 years in teaching and training critical care medicine. He has got a special interest in echocardiographic optimization of hemodynamic status and ultrasonography in critical care and renal replacement therapy. And uh, he is a member of the A12 Board of Indian Journal of Critical Care Medicine and uh, he will be delivering on pathophysiology uh, COVID-19 uh, updates. He will be delivering lecture. And uh, shall I introduce the second speaker also? Yeah, please go ahead. Oh, sorry. The second speaker is Dr. Anup Kumar. He is a well-known personality. He is chief of care medicine in Baby Memorial Hospital, Calicut, Kerala. He is a DNB teacher in critical care medicine and uh, he is appreciated for early diagnosis of Nipah virus during Calicut Nipah outbreak in 2018. And he is involved in COVID prevention and management. Uh, he is also a member of the Kerala government uh, uh, for the advisory panel of the COVID management. And we have got uh, two well versed with the COVID management uh, team of uh, these uh, speakers available. It will be a beneficial talk for all the postgraduates and the practicing anesthesiologists. Now I request the first speaker, Dr. Jose Chako, to take over, sir. Dr. Balji, sir. Yeah, I think the speakers have been introduced. Uh, ah. I welcome them to the forum. Ah. And uh, rather than spending any time on the introduction, which uh, you know these speakers are very well known to everyone, I would like the speakers to speak for themselves and uh, let's listen to their words of wisdom. Uh, Dr. Joe Seco, uh, the stage is all yours. Thank you so much, Dr. Barjit, and thanks, Dr. Kamisha. I'll just uh, switch on my PowerPoint. Is my PowerPoint visible to you all? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here this evening to present on the pathophysiology of COVID-19, which has really left a trail of disaster across the world as we speak, with more than 900,000 people dead in the last six months or so, 73,000 people dead already in India. And in my own hometown, Bangalore, we have roughly 3,000 cases every day and about 50 people die every day because of COVID-19. So that's how this problem has beset us over the last several months. 
The concrete organism, the SARS-CoV-2, is a very special, very atypical kind of virus. How does it enter the cell and how does it cause so much harm to everyone? It attaches itself to the ACE2 receptor on the cell wall and gains entry into the cell. And once it gains entry into the cell, it sheds its RNA and this RNA takes over the host mitochondria and it forces the host mitochondria to replicate the RNA several fold. And this RNA form viruses and these viruses escape from the cell and go on to infect other cells as well, causing widespread harm to the whole body, primarily to the lung. So how does it all happen at the basic level? There are two essential pathways that the virus takes to harm. First is through thrombosis, and second is through an immune response with the release of cytokines. So thrombosis is activated in bacterial sepsis, we all know there is cytokine release as it is in viral infections like COVID-19. The clotting cascade gets activated. In addition, there is inhibition of fibrinolytic activity because of excessive plasminogen activator inhibitor. So fibrinolysis is actually inhibited. So that leads to microvascular clotting. This is what happens in sepsis that we are all familiar with. And this classically results in prolonged prothrombin time, activated partial pro pro thromboplastin time as well. But the D-dimer levels are normal in bacterial sepsis. Now, what happens with COVID-19 infection and other such viral infections? There is, in addition to the clotting, to the excessive clotting that we described, there is enhanced fibrinolytic activity as well in the lung particularly. And this is through a urokinase type plasminogen activator that leads to plasminogen activation and fibrinolytic activity within the lung. <clears throat> Besides, the ACE2 receptor, which maintains the anticoagulant activity becomes dysfunctional. So there is no anticoagulant activity. The balance tilts in favor of excessive clotting. Moreover, the tissue factor coagulation pathway is also activated, leading to intravascular clotting. On the other hand, the protein C-mediated anticoagulant pathway is inhibited. So on the one hand, there is a tilting of balance in favor of clotting. And besides, through a unique phenomenon of enhanced plasminogen activation within the lung through a urokinase type plasminogen activator, there is excessive fibrinolytic activity within the lung. That's the reason why we see high levels of D-dimer very often in sick patients with COVID-19. So where does this all lead to? When there is a balance or tilting of balance in favor of clotting, as autopsy studies have shown us so far, there is widespread clotting within the pulmonary vasculature. This is in fact one of the key abnormalities that you see in severe COVID-19 pneumonia. Pulmonary endothelial dysfunction, intravascular clotting within the lung, as also the formation of new blood vessels, neovascularization, all this has been shown in autopsy studies. And moreover, several studies to date have really borne testimony to the fact that because of widespread clotting, thrombotic disorders are fairly common, even as initial presentation of COVID-19. In fact, we had several patients actually who presented with acute myocardial infarction, who presented with acute stroke against a background of COVID-19. Many of these patients may not have a primary lung problem to begin with. They come with acute myocardial infarction or an acute stroke. And when you test them, you find that they are positive for COVID-19. So extensive clotting can happen, which can lead to catastrophes such as acute myocardial infarction and acute stroke. One of the other phenomena that is commonly seen in COVID-19 is secondary hemophagocytic lymphocytic 
histiocytosis, by which this essentially is because of cytokine release, the macrophages get activated and the activated macrophages, they devour or eat blood cells, including RBCs, white cells, as well as platelets. That results in the typical picture that you see with high ferritin levels, high LDH levels. So if you see all this, this is likely to be due to macrophage activation and secondary hemophagocytic lymphocytic histiocytosis. And, and perhaps this is the reason why corticosteroids have been found to be effective in reducing mortality in COVID-19. The underlying mechanism may be the inhibition of the secondary HLH phenomenon. The other very interesting pathophysiology in COVID-19 is a thrombotic microangiopathy kind of syndrome. Normally, von Willebrand factor is actually a procoagulant factor because it adheres to the endothelium. And once it adheres to the endothelium, it attracts platelets towards it. And these form a conglomerate and lead to intravascular clotting. So that's instigated by von Willebrand factor and platelet adherence to von Willebrand factor. Now, in thrombotic microangiopathy, which may be one of the underlying mechanisms in COVID-19, there is a relative deficiency of ADAMTS13. ADAMTS13, as you know, is required to cleave the thrombus formed by von Willebrand multimers. But however, in COVID-19, like in other forms of thrombotic microangiopathy, there may be a deficiency of ADMTS13, which leads to failure of cleaving of the von Willebrand multimers, and that results in unabated intravascular clotting. So overall, there is excessive thrombogenesis within the lung as well as in other parts of the body in COVID-19. Now, what happens to the lungs? The primary organ that the SARS-CoV-2 targets and the primary organ, the failure of which leads to such catastrophic results, including a high fatality in severe COVID-19. In the initial stage of the illness, as you see here, this is actually one of our own patients who presented to us a couple of weeks ago. The consolidation is minimal. You see that only a very small part of the lung is involved. And at this stage, they are usually mildly symptomatic, or even if they are severely hypoxic, and if they, even if they require ventilation, you will find that they are fairly easy to ventilate in that you don't require high pressures to deliver the tidal volumes that you set, one. You don't require increased PEEP levels for oxygenation. They don't seem to be recruitable. They are fairly well recruited at baseline. And prone ventilation may help these patients, may help improve the hypoxia, but they remain the lungs remain very compliant, or the elastance, which is the reciprocal of compliance, is low. This is supposedly, or this is termed the L type, or the low elastance type of COVID-19 in the early stage of the disease. Now, the L type is, as I mentioned, fairly easy to manage in terms of ventilator support. You don't need high pressures, you don't need high peeps, but they can progress to the H type, which you see here on the right frame, as the consolidation worsens, the lung becomes stiffer, the elastance increases, the compliance declines. And that's when you require high ventilation pressures. You might require high levels of PEEP to recruit the lung. So somebody who started off as a low elastance type of lesion within the lung can very easily progress to the H-type. There again, this is a H-type which is characterized by very thick infiltrates, air bronchograms, as you can see, widespread consolidation of both sides. And in this situation, ventilation will be difficult, compliance will be low, and you may need to use high pressures, PEEP levels, as well as prone ventilation to enable oxygenation in these patients. As I mentioned, when you start, 
lung involvement is minimal most of the lung is most of the lung is ventilated and there are only a few areas which are non ventilated and which are consolidated however what happens if these patients become breathless if they become distressed if they have a high respiratory drive you put them on high flow nasal cannula or niv and because they seem to be settling down or you perceive them to be settling down you carry on with non invasive ventilation or high flow nasal cannula unfortunately the longer it takes to heal the harder it is to come back from this situation because unabated spontaneous respiratory drive particularly in patients who have a vigorous spontaneous respiratory drive can very easily lead to worsening of the lung by a phenomenon called patient self inflicted lung injury vigorous inspiratory efforts worsens the lung lesions and the lung essentially becomes poorly compliant compliant and it gets converted to the high elastin phenotype as you can see on this frame most of the lung was ventilatable but if you have a patient who is distressed if the distress is not relieved by an iv if you continue with an iv for a long period of time high fio2s this is what results the lung becomes less compliant more involved with self inflicted lung injury and from there it is very hard to come back even if you intubate them ventilate them at that stage comebacks are difficult from this situation now there have been several stories we've had a few patients too of patients with covid-19 who present you like this saturation in the 70s and 80s with apparently with reasonable level of comfort they're not distressed they're not particularly distressed if you ask them they say i'm okay i'm not breathless this has intrigued clinicians across the world for quite a few weeks now there are several explanations that are offered there are many possible reasons the reasons are manifold and it could be any one of those but some of the important reasons we already know there is widespread intravascular clotting and that can lead to increased shunt within the lung can lead to hypoxia without any obvious increase in respiratory effort the other reason that i already described in the early stage of the disease in the early stage of the disease you have very few parenchymal lesions in the lung the lung parenchyma is not very much involved however although the lung parenchyma is not involved there is increase in intrapulmonary shunt now why does this happen normally within the shunt within the lung ventilation and perfusion are almost equally matched the ventilation to perfusion ratio is 0.8 almost uh, equal and if the lung is diseased due to any reason be it consolidation collapse pneumonia there is a protective mechanism wherein blood vessels constrict this happens because it will prevent blood from shunting through the lung without picking up oxygen from these diseased areas so this phenomenon is called hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction however in covid-19 one of the obvious things that happen is even though the lung is diseased badly because of consolidation hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction does not occur the blood vessels in these areas remain vasodilated and blood flows through these diseased areas they don't pick up oxygen and it is essentially a shunt which leads to intrapulmonary shunting and reduced oxygen levels however as i mentioned because in the initial phase of the illness the lung parenchyma is not very much involved hence the lung mechanics is not much affected so the respiratory effort itself may not be too uncomfortable for the patient although he may be hypoxic because of the intrapulmonary shunt due to inhibition of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction in fact there are at least two studies that have conclusively shown that this phenomenon occurs in fact i have seen in two patients in our icu as well 
who had evidence of intrapulmonary shunting. How do you check for it? You do the bubble test by injecting agitated saline or a central or a peripheral line. You just need to inject rapidly, 20 to 30 mils of saline will do. And if you see opacification of the left heart, after three to five beats, it is strongly suggestive of an intrapulmonary right to left shunting and hypoxia because of that. It is important in terms of treatment as well, because if there is evidence of shunt, obviously you would need to reduce your ventilation pressures, reduce your PEEP rather than increase it as you would normally do in your hypoxic patient. So this is a very profound mechanism why patients with COVID-19 may be hypoxic, but they may not be breathless. The other possible reason is because the carotid bodies, they are actually the receptors for hypoxia. They sense hypoxia and stimulate breathing by stimulation of the medulla, respiratory centers in the medulla. So the SARS-CoV-2 there are ACE receptors, ACE2 receptors within the carotid body, and they get involved by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And when that happens, the hypoxic drive may be inhibited. The carotid body is no longer able to sense hypoxia. It does not send signals to the medulla oblongata. So there is no overdrive, there is no stimulation of ventilation, and these patients do not become tachypneic. So inhibition of the hypoxic drive may be one of the other reasons. Intrapulmonary shunt, as I mentioned, is the other problem. There are many other reasons as to why, according to Martin Tobin, who wrote a paper on it recently, as to why patients with COVID-19 may not be distressed, they may not be hypoxic. One of the reasons, as I mentioned, is because the carotid body is stimulated by hypoxia. If the carbon dioxide levels are within normal limits, if the PCO2 levels is within 30, 39, 40 millimeters of mercury, it does not stimulate the respiratory drive. So unless the carbon dioxide is high, it may not stimulate the hypoxic drive and give rise to patient discomfort. Many of these patients do not have carbon dioxide retentions, and so they don't feel the sense of dyspnea at all. One of the other reasons may be age-related inhibition of the hypoxic response. As you become older, the hypoxic response from the carotid body declines as well. That's why older patients in general may withstand hypoxia to a much lower level without having any objective evidence of breathlessness. So that may be one of the reasons. Many COVID-19 patients are elderly and COVID-19 is in fact primarily a disease of the elderly, although it does affect younger people as well. So in many of these patients, there may be inhibition of the hypoxic drive, mainly because of the, the lack of adequate sensitivity to the carotid body and they may not exhibit over dyspnea in spite of hypoxia. Diabetes, because of autonomic neuropathy, may also lead to a diminished subjective sensation of dyspnea. And these patients, diabetic patients, many of many patients with SARS-CoV-2 infection are in fact diabetic and they may not feel dyspnea as their normal counterparts would. Then of course, in general terms, pulse oximetry is not very reliable at low saturation levels. Below a saturation level of 70 to 80%, pulse oximeters are generally quite inaccurate because they are not really calibrated to read the saturation from such low levels. So they may show very low levels. In fact, anecdotally, we have also seen many patients with saturation saying 20, 30, sometimes even less than 10 without developing bradycardia, hypoxic cardiac arrest and so on. So at that level, pulse oximetry generally underestimates the saturation by a variable degree and it may not be reliable below a saturation of say 70, 80%. One of the other reasons why these patients may be hypoxic, low saturation, but not breathless is because of fever. Fever displaces the oxygen dissociation curve to the right, which essentially means for a given level of PO2, the saturation will be low. So fever may give you a falsely low saturation level. P 
purely because the shift of the ODC to the right. So that's another reason why these patients with COVID-19 infection may remain reasonably comfortable in spite of what looks like low saturation. So, so this is essentially the basic pathophysiology of COVID-19. The main problem lies within the lung blood vessels, extensive clotting within the lung. Extensive clotting happens in other organs as well, including the heart, which can manifest as acute myocardial infarction or acute stroke. You can have you can have excessive cytokine release. You can have excessive levels of D-dimers, ferritin, activation of HLH, secondary HLH can occur. All these things lead to multi-organ failure, but it's predominantly lung failure, at least to begin with. But many of these patients, in fact, go on to develop multi-organ failure as time passes by. So that's it, folks. So hopefully we will see an end to this pandemic very soon. Maybe one of the several vaccines that are being tried will come up with answers and we will escape from this major disaster in the near future. Thank you very much. Dr. Sinesh. Uh, Joseph, uh, can I just uh, stop uh, sharing? Okay, just hold on, I will do so. I think Dr. Sinesh has uh, muted himself. I will, yeah. I will mute. Anyway, uh, Dr. Kamaro already introduced. I'll, uh, I'll stop. Yeah, yeah. Fine. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. I think uh, Dr. Thank Kamaro you very much, sir. Nice, very nice talk, uh, Dr. Chako. You have highlighted about the hypoxia aspect, uh, which many people are having many doubts on that. Uh, they have clarified very clearly with all the possible mechanisms and all these things. And uh, I think we can go for the question answers at the end of two lectures. That will be better, I think. I think that will so, be better. Yes. Ah, okay, sir. Okay, sir. You have already introduced the next speaker. Ah. The next speaker, Dr. Anup Kumar, to, uh, to, to start this uh, presentation. Dr. Anup Kumar, please. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for uh, ICA for giving me this opportunity. More than that, I'm very happy to share this platform with uh, my teacher, uh, Dr. Josh Chako. Whatever I learned in critical care, I learned from uh, Dr. Josh Chako. And again, my uh, anesthesiology teacher, Dr. Sanishi, is also there. So it's a really happy moment for me to share the platform with uh, two of my uh, favorite teachers and again, many stalwarts in uh, anesthesiology. So here, uh, there are so many uh, parts where I will be overlapping with uh, Josh, sir. Uh, Basically, I'll be trying to give you an overview about the disease, uh, 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 a few uh, aspects about uh, the pathophysiology, what Joseph has already told. I'll just uh, try to summarize. Uh, then the, the diagnostic modalities available, uh, the current treatment options, how the disease tra uh, transmits, and in OR, how the infection control measures has to be uh, set and uh, what are the available options for uh, treatment based on the current evidences. I know it's a huge topic uh, because uh, BRK sir told me to include all these uh, topics to the talk, uh, but I will be uh, just uh, running through all these uh, topics and at the end we can have a detailed discussion. Joseph has already mentioned about the SARS-CoV-2, how it attaches to the ACE2 uh, receptors, all those things. and uh, as you are all aware, it has become a huge pandemic and uh, all the states in India are getting affected and the numbers are really uh, going alarmingly uh, high. So uh, just to uh, understand the epidemiology, so as you all know, uh, like when a person, an infected person is coming into contact uh, with another person, he will get infected. And after a few days, he will become symptomatic. This is called an incubation period. That can vary from uh, like 2 to almost uh, 12 to 13 days. On an average, we say about 3 to uh, 5 days. 
so from this infected time for the next uh, the person to uh, get uh, infection it is called the generation time and from one symptomatic to another symptomatic it is called a serial interval and uh, this is again from the symptomatic uh, from uh, the symptomatic to the next infected this is called uh, time from onset of symptom to transmission called toss time so th these are the different terminologies epidemiological terminologies we uh, usually use uh, now this is a very very uh, important slide and uh, as an anesthesiologist or practicing physicians we should be uh, well aware about this thing so here you can see there are uh, three phases of the disease one thing like a pre symptomatic before the onset of symptoms then an early symptomatic phase and a late symptomatic phase so the majority of the transmission is occurring in the pre symptomatic phase that is on two days prior to the onset of symptoms so if you are getting a patient at that point of time or if you are having a contact with a person who is in the pre symptomatic period so at that point of time also you will be completely asymptomatic so that group of persons are likely to transmit the disease more then we have the early symptomatic uh, phase where the patient is coming with the fever cough throat pain all those things Th those initial uh, two days are also will be very uh, highly infectious followed by the infectivity will gradually decline and it is very very unlikely that after 10 days the person is likely to uh, transmit the disease that is why nowadays we go uh, with the uh, time based discharge strategy like after 10 days of onset of uh, symptoms uh, like we don't have to uh, do a repeat test because these people are unlikely to, tran to transmit the disease and uh, he should be asymptomatic for last two days so majority of the states in india has already adopted this po uh, policy unfortunately few states still uh, uh, do an antigen or a pcr test at the end of 10 or 14 days look for a, a negativity and discharge but please understand there is no test of cure in SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. You cannot do a particular test and say that this patient is cured. Okay. Or you don't have to do a, uh, like a PCR test and say this patient is cured. Even like last two, day, uh, two days before I was seeing, like all the medias were flashing the news that uh, the great singer SPB uh, has tested negative for SARS-CoV-2. It is just a media hype. It doesn't carry any value as far as the patient management is concerned even if that pcr test uh, the positivity is persisting that means you are just uh, detecting few viral particles alone okay so that is about the uh, infectivity the same thing uh, initially we have uh, like as i've already told the symptomatic phase then the viral pcr declines then uh, then by about uh, six or seven days the patient will become sicker and they are likely to land up in the ICU. Okay, so the ICU admission will be towards the end of first week or in the Chinese studies and all they were showing uh, like at, uh, almost from 10 days onwards so, or in short we can say even if a patient is admitted in the ward, he is stable for a few days, you have to tell him or you have to counsel him that if, even if he is developing the complications that will be towards the end of first week. Then. Uh, uh, again, he can develop uh, later on antibody, all those things. He may require a prolonged ventilation and you may even require a tracheostomy. So if you are planning a tracheostomy, always try to uh, uh, like plan it uh, like maybe about uh, two weeks after the onset of symptoms because by this time, the patient will be, un the patient is unlikely to be infective. So even if you do an aerosol generating procedure, there will not be any chance of higher uh, chance of transmission of the disease. So if you want to place a tracheostomy, always try to place it uh, like after almost a week after ventilation or almost uh, two weeks after the onset of symptoms. So this is how uh, the disease progress and again uh, about the infectivity. And uh, this part, uh, Joseph has uh, very beautifully explained. We have an initial viremic phase where the viral load will be very high followed by uh, uh, an inflammatory uh, response settles in. So when the viremic phase started declining, the, 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 the uh, lung changes can start. This is called an early pulmonary phase, followed by towards the end of uh, second week, there can be a severe lung changes called late pulmonary phase. So when we 
initiate a treatment also you should have a clear cut idea about at what phase of the disease the patient is because if the patient is already in a viremic phase or in the early week of a, a, a disease that is a place where you have to give antiviral drugs we will discuss that what are the antiviral drugs uh, which is uh, effective now so we can give an antiviral drug at that viremic phase the same way uh, when you consider the plasma therapy you have to use at that viremic phase because once this antibody titer started developing uh, developing you don't have to again give an antibody because by giving a plasma therapy you are trying to give a an antibody from outside so once this antibody is already there in the body you don't have to give it the same way you should not use these anti inflammatory drugs or steroids in the early viremic phase because it can again worsen the disease or viremia can uh, worsen but at the same time you should start uh, uh, using these anti inflammatory uh, treatment uh, like once the the pulmonary the lung changes uh, uh, starts or towards the end like especially when there is a severe inflammatory changes that is again uh, what are the inflammatory changes and how to assess we will discuss that later so at that point you can uh, think about interleukin 6 uh, inhibitors like uh, tocilizumab or other drugs now coming to the different tests available like how to diagnose and how to do the testing so initially you can do the for an epidemiological purpose you can do uh, an antibody based surveillance or called a zero surveillance because in your hospital or in your community if you want to know how many persons are already exposed because some as it is a, a disease with almost 40% uh, uh, asymptomatic patient you might have missed so many cases so by doing a zero surveillance you can have you can get an idea that how many persons in your institution or in your locality is already infected so that is the antibody screening or the zero surveillance then you can do the diagnosis with either rt pcr or antigen if both these things are negative you can sometimes add antibody test for the uh, the diagnosis if all these things are negative still if you have a high clinical suspicion you can go with the imaging studies especially uh, ct thorax to look for any radiological uh, changes suggestive of uh, sars corona virus then uh, during the disease you can uh, uh, look at the stages of the disease then you can prognosticate based on uh, d dimer values tropi values ferritin etc then the therapeutic monitoring whether the patient is improving we can look at the d dimer ferritin etc then obviously the epidemiological surveillance again the antibody uh, uh, the levels in the patient whether the patient is having a enough antibody or not even if the patient is having an enough antibody we don't know how how long it is going to last but majority of the time it is unlikely to last for more than 3 uh, months so that is why we don't know how long this patient will be uh, protected we call the so called uh, the immunity passport how long it is valid we really don't know but by looking at antibody we look at only humoral immunity we have uh, two uh, parts of immunity one is called an humoral immunity and another is called a cellular immunity by looking at antibody titers you will be looking at humoral immunity only but uh, with the memory t cells you can have a prolonged immunity but again it is not very clear how long you will be having the uh, immunity now coming to the diagnosis how to diagnose i know that you all are uh, like uh, very familiar with this thing to diagnose you have to detect whether the virus is present or you have to see whether there is an immune response to the virus the viral detection can be done by viral nucleic acid or viral antigen so the viral uh, or the immune response can be detected by specific antibodies the vi uh, the the viral nucleic acid or viral uh, antigen that can be uh, done from the nasopharyngeal swab or from the pal uh, fluid the antibodies we usually look at uh, from the blood so this is the usual test we have a uh, antigen antibody and a pcr a test so if the P antigen test is already positive you don't have to repeat a pcr but if you are doing a, a antigen test in a highly suspicious patient or the pre test probability is very high we say or if the patient is symptomatic still the antigen is negative then you have to do a, a pcr test and uh, you have to uh, confirm or exclude because the antigen sensitivity is almost 60 to 65 percentage whereas the uh, the pcr test sensitivity will be almost 70 to 80 percent depending on the phase of the disease again different cohorts are giving different values these are a rough 
estimate what we can give. So usually we take uh, the uh, the specimen from the nasopharynx and we use something called a flock swab. You should know how to take a swab because uh, uh, and again this is the area from where the nasopharynx were from where you have to take the swab because this is the area with more ACU2 receptors and again the viral content in this area will be high. And uh, uh, in an intubated patient, you will be having a more viral content in a sputum or in a uh, uh, bronchoalveolar lavage fluid, but it is highly aerosol generating procedure. So depending on the clinical situation, if your initial diagnosis are uh, uh, not uh, confirmatory, sometimes you can go with the uh, bowel fluid as well. So this is about different body, flu uh, body fluids and the viral uh, yield from those areas, the congenital uh, the the uh, the conjunctival uh, yield is very low. The nasopharyngeal is almost 88 percent. The sputum is almost 98 percent. Is followed by throat swab, etc. But see, the vaginal swab and all is, uh, does not contain, and even blood uh, is very less. Urine is uh, nil, and stool. Uh, depending on the uh, 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 the the type of infection, when the patient is having a GI uh, symptoms, the stool uh, uh, the positivity will be high. And again, the infectivity through these uh, uh, the GI uh, specimens or GI fluids also will be high. Basically, these uh, ACU2 receptors are uh, uh, found in respiratory uh, uh, system and in gastrointestinal system. So you can have symptoms and this viral uh, the presence basically in these uh, areas. And this is another slide looking at div different genomic targets. Just to give you an overview, like when you do a PCR test, usually you look at two different targets. targets. There are many protocols approved by ICMR, WHO, CDC and different countries. I'm not going to all the details about that, but please understand whenever you in, uh, like uh, interpret a report, you have to look at these things. Like initially, uh, sometimes they will be looking at one target in envelope gene, then there can be spike gene, then membrane gene, or like a nucleocapsid gene or uh, like a RNA dependent polymerase chain, uh, a gene or RDRP gene and then open reading frame 1A and 1B. So these are the genetic targets usually we are looking at while doing a PCR test and all the tests whether it is a, a conventional PCR or our true NAT or the CBNAT by gene expert all these tests are po uh, polymerase chain uh, uh, reaction or we call it as uh, RTQ, RT-PCR, or uh, it is a real-time quantitative reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction. So all these tests are uh, RT-PCR tests. So the, don't think that the true NAT or CB NAT is something different, but they do use a different technology. I'm not going into uh, the finer details of all those things. And again, when we do a test like we, uh, uh, these, uh, RNA uh, is usually uh, uh, separated, RNA is extracted, then again it is uh, 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 during a reverse transcription it is made into DNA, then DNA is multiplied, then using a probe uh, like this uh, DNA is detected with a, uh, uh, with a uh, uh, fluorescent technique and you can see how much uh, the time it is taken to detect the, uh, the genomic uh, strand, a specific portion of the strand. So based on that, you can get a value called CT value or cyclic threshold. So the more the CT value, that means the viral content will be less. Or in other words, suppose if the patient is having a CT value 10, then the patient is likely to have more viruses. If the CT value is 30, that means the patient will be having less uh, viruses or CT value is inversely proportional to the viral load. And there are again, many other factors which can interfere with CT values. There is an ICMR recommendation also on that. Uh, but uh, sometimes this high, uh, the very low CT value with a high viral load, uh, it can uh, uh, like uh, give a rough estimate that the, these group of persons will be highly uh, infective or the chances of going for complications will be more in such groups. But again, you cannot uh, 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 say that that will be always true because the sampling error and there are so many other uh, error methods uh, possible. And usually when this is the, uh, the, the area where so much confusion is uh, generated, especially among uh, the practicing physicians and uh, even anesthesiologists. So as I've already told, this is a, a CBNAT report where you can see 
they are looking at nucleic acid and again uh, envelope gene so if both are positive it is say that the sars cov2 is positive but if e is positive and again nucleic acid the second target is negative that is called presumptively positive if both are negative that is called negative and an invalid means if the control is also negative that is called an invalid i will uh, tell about what is this control so here what you have to understand is if only one target is positive like e is positive and this other target is negative that means the patient uh, may be having a very low viral load in an early phase or maybe in a very late phase of the disease where the viral load will be low or maybe this patient is having some other corona virus which is cross reacting with these test so that is also positive so if you get only one target positive that doesn't mean that the patient is having a sars corona virus uh, infection it may be some uh, other corona virus or because of low viral load so in that cases you will have to repeat the test after two days but you have to consider it as negative but as there is a, uh, a remote chance that at a later time it can become positive you have to take all precautions for a positive case when you are dealing with this presumptively positive or doubtful positive cases so this is the way you get a report especially when you do a true nat or cb nat this is a report from a true nat machine you can see they are looking at uh, e gene target the ct value is 13.2 i have already told the cut off is 35 the low ct value means very high and at the same time you have to lo look at control value also here you can see the control is 21 the so usually we'll get a control between 20 to 25 so this control uh, is usually when you take a swab the normal human DNA will be replicated. So if you have adequate human DNA in a sample, that means the sampling is adequate. Suppose this control CT value is more than 30 or more than uh, 27, 28, etc. In a, in a true nat, uh, I'm saying, that means the sampling is not proper. So if you get a very uh, high CT value for a control, that and again you get a negative result, that is again, as I've already told, and the patient is symptomatic, it is better to repeat the sample again. I think I'm not uh, confusing you. This is again a control value becoming very high means that uh, the quality of the sampling may not be very good. This part uh, coming to the different types of lengths, Dr. Uh, uh, Joseph has uh, uh, very beautifully explained that we have two groups of patients, one with a uh, very uh, 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 high compliance where the X-ray and CT will be looking almost normal or we have a normal ARDS pattern. So this is was initially called an L type and now it is called type 1 and we have an H type called type 2. So here when you are ventilating, you know, we have to use low tidal volume, low respiratory rate and normal PEEP and you, may, you can give a very high FiO2 in this group of patients. Here hypoxia may be basically because of the vasculature issue but here it is basically the parenchymal problem where you will have to give uh, enough uh, peep and these uh, patients are likely to respond to peep so these are the two a uh, group of patients this is uh, very very important like this is again from uh, society of critical care medicine or american critical care society so if the patient is having a endo indication for endotracheal intubation you have to go ahead and do that so this is a, a, a very, uh, this is an area where we should be very careful. And I think the centers where they are having a high mortality, the main reason for the high mortality in an intubated patient or an ICU patient is delayed intubation. So everybody is having a feeling that once you intubate a patient with COVID, they are unlikely to recover. And again, if you uh, delay the intubation using NIV or HFNC, they are likely to survive. It is a completely uh, wrong concept. It is not true. You don't have to early intubate the patient. I do admit that. At the same time, you should not unnecessarily delay also. An appropriate time of intubation is very, very crucial in a COVID patient. We will come to that later once again, even though uh, Joseph has also explained that topic. So if the patient is uh, tolerating supplemental oxygen, you can uh, uh, continue with the oxygen target and SP SpO2 of 90 to 96. And again, if it is not, you can consider HFNC or in between, you can give a trial of non-invasive ventilation at any point of time. If you feel that there is an indication for endotracheal intubation, you can go ahead and intubate. And once you intubate or once the patient is becoming hypoxemic, 
or when once you put the patient on a high flow nasal cannula or NIV, along with that treatment, you can do something called a awake repositioning proning protocol, otherwise called CAR protocol. Even if uh, like we are getting infected, we can also try the same maneuver. So initially you can ask the patient to try in a left lateral recumbent position. So what we did is we have made leaflet in re regional languages in our hospital. And the moment uh, we find these patients are developing uh, lung involvement, we, uh, uh, we train them uh, uh, about this protocol. So this one position can be maintained for almost 30 minutes to two hours. Then we can go for the right lateral uh, recumbent position. Then we can ask the patient to uh, go for a, a sitting position in 60 to 90 degrees, again, another 30 to 60 minutes. Then we can ask the patient uh, to lie in the prone position. And again, we can uh, uh, plan a uh, Trendelenburg position also. This Trendelenburg position, usually the patient may not uh, tolerate that. So, and again, you sure your bed also should have a tilting uh, facility. Majority of the ICU bed will be having that. Uh, but at least these uh, four positions you can try. And even if when the patient is uh, on NIV or uh, HFNC or any other uh, oxygen therapy, you can uh, use these methods. And this is again one of the methods which has shown to reduce the mortality in a COVID patient. So you have to initiate this CAR protocol uh, early in the uh, uh, phase of the disease. And how proning improve oxygenation, I think you all know about that because like the dorsal uh, segments of the alveoli will not be get uh, adequately ventilated. But when you prone the patient, these dorsal segments also will get uh, uh, adequate ventilation. The reason being, usually there will be uh, the pressure exerted by the uh, uh, heart over the lungs. So there will be offloading of the lungs by the heart. Then there will be better toileting of secretions when once you prone the uh, patient. And again, the diaphragmatic compression over the lungs also will be less. So because of these three mechanisms, just like uh, when you prone a, a ventilated patient, the same way uh, in an awake patient on oxygen also will improve with this prone measures. So when you prone, uh, again, you have uh, three subsets of patients based on this uh, JAMA article. There are some group of patients who respond nicely so after a few hours, they will uh, oxygenation, everything will improve. But once you supain them, again, they are likely to deteriorate. But there are some other group of patients who are called persistent responders. So once you prone, that improvement will last for uh, a, a few hours or few days, or even if you supine, that uh, response will last. And there are some other groups who will not respond at all. So there are three groups. And those groups who are likely to, who are the persistent responders, they will be, uh, they are likely to do better. And this is about uh, the, the, the smoke dispersion distance with different oxygen devices. This is a, a smoke dispersion uh, distance. So when we uh, uh, do uh, an oxygen therapy, so based on these parameters, you can uh, have a rough estimate of how much aerosol will be generated. So as you know, in a high flow nasal cannula, we have an FiO2 flow and temperature settings. Flow, you can go up to 60. So when you go with a very high flow, again, your dispersion rate will be very high. So usually we try to keep it at somewhere around 40. In a simple mask also, you can the, the dispersion rate will be somewhere around 11 uh, centimeters. But you can see the Venturi mask, uh, when we go for a high FiO2, the dispersion distance is very high. So uh, using a Venturi mask will not be very safe. So even if you want to use a high oxygen, it is better to go for a non-rebreathing uh, mask. So this is again uh, putting all these together. I've already told when the PF ratio or PaO2 by FiO2 ratio is more than 150, you know that the ARDS we divided into mild, moderate and severe based on PF ratio. Mild will be 300 to 200, then moderate 200 to 100 and uh, severe will be less than 100. So this group of patient with a PF ratio more than 150, you can try either NIV or HFNC, or you can again uh, interchange between these two. Or if it is less, it is better to intubate these patients. Please don't wait the patient or please don't maintain these patients on high FiO2 in an NIV or a high FiO2 in an HFNC. That will definitely produce more lung injury as Joseph has mentioned. That can again uh, uh, 
make a significant structural ch uh, changes in the lungs. And uh, so such group of patients are uh, likely to uh, uh, get worse at the end. And when you start an HFNC or NIV, there are different uh, uh, interfaces and you will get confused. I'm not going into all the details about that. But as Joseph has already mentioned, you should understand this patient sensitively infected uh, lung injury, the concept, like because of an excessive drive, uh, the patient can have uh, uh, more lung damage, like usually the capillary leak, impaired gas exchange, increased respiratory drive, all these can uh, definitely produce more uh, self-inflicted lung injury, and that can again worsen the problem. So uh, in a ventilated patient or a uh, you will be pushing air by the ventilator. And suppose if the patient is spontaneously breathing, especially when the patient is having a significant ventilatory drive, uh, that diaphragm and the respiratory muscle will be stretching the uh, alveoli again. So you have one uh, force stretching the alveoli and again, another counter force, which is again stretching more alveoli. So this will again produce more uh, 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 lung injury or the so-called silly. So you have to try to abolish these things. And you can look at uh, by different methods, respiratory rate, increased work of breathing, accessory muscle involvement, et cetera. So all these can uh, uh, give you an idea. Or if the patient is on NIV, if the respiratory rate is more or the tidal volume is very high, or if the minute ventilation is more, that also indicates that the patient is going for a silly. Uh, okay. And again, you should not give more IFAB to such patients. It will definitely increase the silly uh, in such patients. So if you give a use a BiPAP for such patients, definitely the delta P or the, the tidal volume will be more, or the, the pressure support giving will be more. That will again increase the uh, lung injury. At the same time, if you are using an NIV, if you give more CPAP, just like in cardiogenic pulmonary edema, your uh, the lung injury can be minimized. That is one method. So in a patient with a significant uh, CILI, your uh, 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 NIV with a more uh, EPAP will be a better option. Or when you use a HFNC, you will have to use a high flow. The problem with HFNC also, the chances of aerosol generation will be more, you can see. They can uh, use a, a surgical mask for such patients that can definitely reduce the aerosol generation during uh, high flow nasal cannula. So now this is very, very important. Like patient is on an HFNC, how you know that the patient is tolerating that or how you will decide the patient is not tolerating and you have to uh, uh, go for intubation. This is a paper published by Roca and the index is called ROX index. In that paper, he has described an index where SpO2 is divided by FiO2. That is again divided by respiratory rate in a breath per minute. If that index is less than uh, uh, or equal to 4.8, uh, that means the chances of uh, the, the deterioration is more and you have to intubate early. Or if it is more than 4.8, it is means that uh, the HFNC is success. So you can uh, do it at different levels. So you should be aware about this ROX index. Again, you should train your nursing staff to measure this ROX index when the patient is on oxygen. So you don't need the patient to be in HFNC itself. If the patient uh, on NIV or patient on in, uh, or room, uh, room uh, sorry, oxygen, all those patients also you can uh, measure this thing. If the patient is on nasal oxygen based on the HA formula, for one liter, you will have to add for a percentage from the baseline 21 percentage. So these are the papers. Uh, the, the, this paper was looking at uh, this rocks index at uh, two hours, six hours, and even at uh, 12 hours. You can see the patient with a lesser rocks index here, they were putting a cutoff of 4.8. The, the survival in those group of patients were better. And again, at 12 hours also, you can see the survival in those group of patients are better. So in short, Roughly, you can say a ROX index of less than five, you should not weigh too much. And that would be an indication to initiate a uh, mechanical ventilation. The same way, as I've already told, the relative risk of death threshold in the hospital and the time to intubation after uh, HFNC, you can see if the patient is not tolerating and if you continue to uh, use these NIV or HFNC, the, and the late you intubate such patients, then the death risk will be very high. So 
there is no point in unduly prolonging intubation using HFNC or NIV. But you can continue, of course, if the ROX index is uh, uh, more than five or the patient is comfortable looking at other clinical parameter. This paper uh, was also looking at uh, uh, the ROX index, as I've already told, SpO2 by FiO2 divided by respiratory rate. Uh, the advantage of uh, this uh, ROX index is you don't have to do even an ABG by looking at SpO2 and the FiO2 respiratory rate you can do. So in this paper, they looked at uh, ROX index at fourth hour, which is called, uh, you can see this uh, ROX uh, 0 H4. So here they found that if it is less than 5.3, the cumulative incidence of intubation was very high. So that is why putting together, we can roughly say a, a ROX index of five. Another way to assess the, uh, uh, the deterioration in a patient on an HFNC or a patient being, uh, with uh, uh, or oxygen is something called a work of breathing scale. Here, you look at respiratory rate, the nasal flaring, the sternocleidomastoid uh, uh, used by looking at palpation or abdominal muscle uh, used by palpation. So all these nasal flaring, the stenocular accessory muscle use or abdominal mass use were given at one point each. Same way the respiratory rate less than 21 to 25 to 26 to 33 and more than 34. So if the work of breathing score is a scale is more than four, again, the patient is likely to develop severe CLE. And that is also an indication to uh, uh, intubate such patients. Or you can try HFNC or NIV, but provided your WOB uh, uh, scale should come uh, less than four years. You look at these respiratory rate itself. A rate of more than 30 itself give a, a scoring of four. So a very tachypneic patient, you should not maintain on HFNC or NIV. And this is another uh, uh, diagram, which is again, uh, uh, which is showing, they were looking at uh, the progression of uh, lung injury at uh, different phases. One, the initial one is a spontaneous one. The second one is the uh, controlled ventilation at different phases of uh, respiration. You can see the overstretching of a lung, which is uh, happening during the spontaneous breathing and during the controlled breathing. So you have to uh, uh, like intubate at proper time. And again, you can see the volumetric uh, stra uh, strain happening in spontaneous railway and mechanical ventilating patients. Here, obviously, the strain is more in spontaneously breathing patient. So this is, an, again, another point. I think uh, you all will be very familiar with that. So when you use an NIV also, usually the previously, when you use a single limb circuit, we are using a mask without any bend here or any leak here. But in a, uh, a COVID patient, to reduce the aerosol generation or aerosol transmission, you have to use a non-bended mask or a mask without leak followed by a, uh, a, a HME filter or a viral filter, then there should be a leak port. This is the way you have to uh, make a uh, ventilatory circuit. And again, this ABCD approach in a ICU patients when liberating from ICU, like uh, uh, the, you have to manage the pain, you will have to give the spontaneous breathing trial, the adequate analgesia sedation, you have to uh, prevent the delirium, you have to mobilize the patient and again, uh, the family uh, man engagement and empowerment you can do. So what we are doing is uh, like an all ICU admitted patient, we will uh, have uh, uh, scheduled uh, the video conferencing with the bystanders. There are so many methods. You can have a, a sophisticated software or even your Skype or WhatsApp call you can activate. And if the patient is conscious enough, we will uh, discuss the bystanders over these video calling and we will make uh, the patients also interact with the, uh, their relatives, okay? If the patient is already sedated, intubated, et cetera, we will show the relatives over the video conferencing. And as an anesthesiologist, we should know about sedation as well. Usually, as you know, all other situations, we were using dexmedetomid in propofol or propofol infusion, et cetera, or midazolam uh, infusions or, uh, along with uh, an opioid, an analgo sedation. This is the usual protocol we all were using. But you can try other third line agents also because you may not be having enough uh, syringe pump, especially in this pandemic situation. So you can give lorazepam boluses or an intermittent uh, 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 haloperidol, valproate, cutipin, or you can give uh, sh scheduled lorazepam or dicepam even orally or even IV intermittent dose. Or you can give a uh, clonazepam, phenobarbital, etc. The chlorohydrate is not uh, commonly used nowadays. So even these agents can also be used in a ventilated patient. Previously, as I've already told, all the 
standard practice is anergel sedation with a short acting midazolam with a or benzodiazepine with a short acting fentanyl so this is uh, uh, like a, uh, another diagram whenever you design an icu or a operating room or a ward you should have a basic idea how to design that so any uh, i think you all will be very familiar with that even if it is an operating room the same thing will be applicable so this is the way you have to design icu or a general ward so you should have a staff entry area which is a completely uninfected area which is called a green area or a donning area so you should wear appropriate ppe in this area and from this area you have to enter in the yellow zone otherwise called a uh, uh, anti room or an intermediate zone so here again the the it will not be infected but again there may be some staff coming this area etc so this is not very clean so you should enter it with the uh, the pp only in this area then you have a, a positive area or a red zone where the covid patients are kept so usually the if it is a ward the patients will be uh, kept in separate uh, rooms or if it is an icu ideally to place these patients in cubicles or you can uh, uh, keep a negative pressure chambers that or majority of the time what in my hospital and all what we have done is uh, like i have uh, converted my uh, the, the 14 bedded icu into a 9 bedded icu so we have uh, something uh, like as you know a air handling unit will be there so in that air handling unit ideally you have to place a hepa filter but if you are having an old air handling unit it may not Uh, resist uh, the resistance offered by a hepa filter so you can put a uv light in a uh, air handling unit along with that you can uh, put multiple industrial grade exhaust fans here so that will make uh, the air exchange possible and again this area negative so that the viral load in that area will be less that is a simple way to convert an icu into a covid room then after this area you have to enter into a doffing area from doffing you have to remove all those area then if you have a second layer uh, ppe something like a plastic apron etc that from this end room you can uh, remove that and you can go to the showering and you have to exit the patient actually should not use the uh, area which is used by the staff members they should have a direct entry to the positive area so this is how you have to design a covid ward or a covid icu so suppose if it is a operating room so what is the difference so here this is a concept it should be very clear for all anesthesiologists uh, like you should have a donning area then you should have an anti room here what is the uh, uh, importance is support if uh, suppose if it is a surgeon and if he wants to uh, again wear all these sterile uh, 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 garments over the pp then he can uh, uh, use it from the uh, this anti room or an intermediate room because he is already in pp and then he can enter into the covid room so this covid area or an operating room cannot be in a negative pressure that should be very very clear if you make an operating room negative pressure that means you are again the uh, the the air will be coming from all this area into this operating room and the chances of infection will be very high so if you want to do this aerosol generating procedure intubation etc in a negative pressure room you have to make a separate negative pressure area room other than this uh, operating room and you can intubate the patient from that area then you can shift to the uh, uh, covid room where uh, during the intubation also the, the the persons in that area should be minimal and from this room you can go to the doffing room and an exiting room as i have already told that uh, the the idea here also is same now there are uh, many uh, air exchanges uh, also and depending on the air exchanges you have to decide how much uh, time the the uh, you have to wait till uh, next patient is entering so usually you, you should have a uh, like a 10 plus exchanges where uh, you can uh, take uh, within uh, half an hour or so so depending on the air exchanges you can decide how long you have to wait uh, before taking another patient and there are other standards of minimum air exchanges uh, air air changes per hour then the temperature humidity etc i am not going into the all details so this is about the intubating room or if you are intubating a patient in an icu also you try to keep the patient in a negative pressure room so even if your icu don't have a, uh, all the cubes uh, cubicles are negative pressure at least make one or two uh, negative pressure rooms shift the patient into the negative pressure room then uh, you have to connect the monitor 
the then the airway equipment should be on the other side then the person who is intubating should be there on the head and side then you should have a, uh, a nurse who is uh, helping you to uh, give the drugs etc or he can look at monitor as well then you should have a, a person to give required pressure airway equipment etc so you should try to intubate the patient using only three persons if you need an additional person you can uh, keep them as a runner he should be outside the negative pressure room okay so if you anticipate a difficult airway etc the record or airway equipment person can be more skilled in uh, uh, the airway manipulation he can also assist in ventilation like especially when you go for a two person ventilation so this is the way you have to design your uh, intubating room as i have already told in ot also you can try if you have a negative pressure separate room you can uh, intubate the patient from that area you can induce then later on you can shift the patient to a, a positive operating room with a hepa filter okay but you should have a hepa filter in that area or as i have already told you should have your enough air exchangers and you can use uv light in the uh, air holding area and again uh, like when you convert an ambu bag also you should put a hme filter in the ambu bag Uh, like you can see you have to put an hme filter then uh, you you can put all other uh, like peep valve etc even your vein circuit or whatever circuit you are uh, using there also you can you should uh, put a, a filter here and again this aerosol generation should be uh, minimized now coming to the drugs i'm not going into the details because of shortage of time so this is uh, only one antiviral drug at this point of time which is having a promising evidence it is having evidence in cells and again it is already having emergency use authorization and uh, the use will be uh, uh, like uh, depending on moderate to severe infection you can uh, go for 200 mg on day 1 then you can go up to 6 days or uh, up to 11 days the cost in india uh, the brands are available from 2700 rupees to almost 4300 rupees so like again if you are getting a patient in the viremic phase this, uh, uh, with a significant uh, 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 the changes you can go with a remdesivir i'm not going to all the other details favipiravir is having a tentative or a mixed evidence but comparatively like next to uh, remdesivir if you want to uh, uh, make a or uh, keep a viral drug and viral drug that will be favipiravir but this ivermectin it is uh, it is basically not having any uh, in vivo studies basically they have put this ivermectin into a, a cell clone and that was showing a very good effect but you cannot attain that much ivermectin concentration in a human cells uh, so it will be in a toxic dose so ivermectin is also not having enough uh, evidences lopinavir ritonavir is not at all promising even though the initially it was tried it all the trials are showing a negative evidence and hydroxychloroquine all the trials are showing negative evidence and again there is no role for uh, like prophylaxis with hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine and majority of the centers have stopped using hydroxy uh, chloroquine even though icmr or some of the state guidelines are still uh, used for that the convalescent plasma uh, again today, today the, there is a trial published by icmr classic trial i'm not going into the details about all those things so what you have to understand is uh, like they have not separately analyzed uh, the early usage and late usage that is why i have shown you an initial diagram where in a viremic phase where there is no enough antibody you can give a uh, convalescent plasma when the patient is deteriorating but uh, like at the end of one week if patient is already having a antibody response there is no logic in giving an additional antibody from outside and it may sometimes worsen the situation because of something called a antibody dependent uh, enhancement of these inflammatory response so you don't have to try that so as of today the evidence for convalescent plasma is also very weak even the indian trial is very weak but again they have not specifically look at uh, looked at the neutralizing capacity of a plasma so if you are looking at the neutralizing titer there are two ways of looking neutralizing titer i am not going into the all the details about that but if you you uh, look at neutralizing titer and if you give a high neutralizing titer plasma in the early phase of disease that may be promising but obviously you will have to wait for uh, like uh, uh, subgroup analysis or further results as on the uh, uh, as per the paper published today this placid trial we don't have enough evidences the monoclonal antibodies were uh, uh, tried again uh, mixed evidences interferon in the previously called the cuban magical drug or other interferons again uh, the evidences are very very weak 
but dexamethasone and steroids are really having promising evidence especially when the patient is developing hypoxemia towards the end of viremic phase you can start the patient on uh, like 8 mg of uh, dexamethasone uh, once daily uh, i'm not going to the other uh, uh, details the cytokine inhibitors are also there especially uh, the tocilizumab interleukin 6 inhibitors so this is another area where uh, we are going wrong i think by looking at il6 levels we all have a tendency to give uh, tocilizumab but this uh, actimra trial even uh, the the trial by the manufacturers of this molecule is also negative and even if you look at uh, il6 values i was just randomly looking at il6 values in other septic patients in my icu all patients are having very high, high il6 values so looking at ilc values if you want to give tocilizumab i think almost all icu patients will uh, 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 we will have to use tocilizumab uh, so definitely there is no evidence for tocilizumab in, uh, in such group but obviously there is another group called a cytokine storm syndrome or a macrophage activation like syndrome where you look at serum ferritin you look at uh, 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 the the uh, cytopenias elevated liver enzymes coagulopathy or there is something called an h score where the score is more than 169 in that group of patients like previously we were using high dose steroid atomidate uh, sorry uh, 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 high dose uh, steroid uh, uh, etc so in those group of patients you can try uh, tocilizumab but not for all patients with the uh, high il6 levels there are blood purification uh, filtration system were also tried uh, basically to reduce these inflammatory markers that was also beautifully reducing the uh, uh, the inflammatory mediators or il6 etc but uh, the clinically that was also not very promising uh, other uh, studies which we have already used the prawn positioning uh, the ventilatory strategies which we have uh, described that is obviously having a uh, definite role anticoagulants this is also very very important those are as already uh, uh, explained the pathophysiology behind that so especially when the patient is having a very high d dimer values with the other inflammatory changes you have to uh, put the patient on double dose of uh, low molecular weight heparin and you have to what you have to keep in mind is such patients when you are discharging when their baseline values are uh, almost uh, twice than the normal you have to put that patient on uh, like oral anticoagulant for at least uh, 90 days more usually we go with the uh, 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 rivaroxaban or other uh, oral anticoagulants that is also very important because the patients are recovering with covid i have seen many patients that are coming with pulmonary embolism uh, uh, coronary uh, uh, events or like uh, uh, the stroke or uh, pulmonary embolism etc uh, and again there are so many other uh, the pseudo science and fraud uh, treatment which is uh, doesn't uh, 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 again have uh, any value i'm not going to all the details so uh, thank you so much i i was just trying to give you an overview about uh, the disease the diagnosis and uh, other aspects so the rest of the thing i think uh, we can have a, a discussion and josar is also uh, josar is here to uh, uh, answer all those uh, main queries he is a uh, uh, better expert than me in this field BRK sir, uh, you are muted, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Noor Kumar. Yeah. Well, uh, you have made the concepts very, very clear. Uh, the literature about these, uh, you know, cases uh, varies from day to day, and as of now, I think uh, the way uh, Dr. Josh Chaku had initially described the pathophysiology. I mean, it was so simple and uh, in in such clear, uh, I would say, uh, concept that he had. It was so easily understandable, and uh, and then you have gone on to uh, describe the various uh, treatments which are available. Uh, you know, covering all aspects of uh, uh, the treatment. Uh, compliments to both the speakers. Uh, wonderfully done. Uh, you know, uh, talks. And now we'll be going to uh, the question answer session. Uh, there are a few questions which are there in the question box and uh, yeah that's it but yeah uh, so before sir you would like before we start the question and answer session okay i'll hold yeah. on could you end your wherever you are
I'm Good evening, sorry. sir. I was able to we catch a bit later. We are with you. But you are all lucky. Today we have two celebrities in anesthesia as a moderating persons. They are real celebrities. They are masters. Over four decades, they are working in anesthesia. They were the mentors and guides to scores of people. Then budding anesthesiologists were made, made anesthesiologists and they are occupying very good position. Well, Belgit now works as dean with an institute in Delhi. And whereas Dr. Kamesha Rao is working as principal and director at a college in Andhra Pradesh. They are really good friends of mine. They are trustworthy friends. They are really, I don't have words to express their abilities and capabilities, and they are good. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. And Dr. Jos and Dr. Anu. Well, as far as I know, when the cold disease started coming in India or started appearing or started making his rumblings, well, Anu as well as those were involved in the management. That means they were involved in the management of COVID or coronavirus since over the last six months. So I thought they are the best persons to deal on this particular topic. And I'm so happy they have really given a good lecture. And Joe's as usual, a matter of fact lecture. He never wants to touch on the sides even. He just went straight and go to the topic. I know why he insisted. I know that he had to give, well, a real rundown on every particular aspect and more things he missed, which we will be asking in the question and session. Now, I don't want to make it long. Well, question and session is open. I will start with the first question. The only question what I want to ask you, I know Joe's as well as a moderators. Well, the corona started, or say the COVID starts in Wuhan of China. Well, China has more population than India. And the reporter case, probably India is underreporting, China is underreporting. That's a different issue. Well, the how come this particular virus was very kind in China and it was really becoming very mad in India? Because more number of cases are coming up here in India. Is there a genetic mutation? That's what I would like to know. That means, will we know about this particular mutation going on? Is it true that a mutation comes up? A mutation comes up every six weeks. That's what I am told through some literature. Is it correct? Or is it there is something else? Well, either of the moderators or the speakers may be able to address this question. Why that much of difference between the number of cases in China and number of cases in India? Because China has almost 50% more population than us. Still, we are. I'm not comparing about the Brazil or America or Italy or anywhere. I'm comparing only two and that two in the Asia Pacific region and neighboring countries. India. Sir, I'm Really willing to hear your yes, answer. Sir, Thank you, sir, for your interactive words, Dr. Radhakrishnan. I'm very happy to see you, sir. And uh, my thinking about a very good question, sir, what you asked, uh, it, it is doubting me since a long time. And uh, one possibility is uh, when first they reported it in Wuhan, they have completely sealed that uh, uh, province from the rest of the China. They effectively uh, deployed all the force to that place and uh, control the spread and uh, taking adequate precautionary measures. Because, you know, in India, when the first case reported, there were no PPEs, there were no other equipment uh, to combat even masks, everything was a case state. Whereas... Oh, China even when the first a... case was reported, that was reported in Kerala only, through Kerala yeah, only. In January, in, in January. Ah, in January. Oh. Even mm. that day, PPE kit was made available here. Okay, mm. I can't say that. Everything was here. But since... We have in that particular democratic attitude with us, probably we are a bit lax. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas they have the totalitarian attitude, other totalitarian attitude in China. They were, they were under control. Probably that way you may be able to score over the matter. 
Uh, I think that answer, Chako can give good explanation for that. The answer to this <laughs> probably is more political than clinical. I would say that, and I fully agree with the Dr. Kamesha Rao uh, that uh, the kind of control they had when there was first, uh, uh, you know, uh, epidemic that they suspected, and the way they controlled things. Uh, that was very, very aggressive, uh, unlike uh, what we have here in India. And yes, uh, Dr. Jos can certainly uh, add on to it, or maybe uh, Dr. Nufar also can add to it. Okay, let her know when Jos come. Yeah. I, I I certainly agree with the views aired by everybody else, and that there are two main reasons why the outbreak didn't reach the level in China as it is happening in India, and it's uh, going on and on and on without an end in sight at all. The first and uh, most obvious reason is they are obviously underreporting events. There is no doubt about that. It is not a completely open society, as the world knows, like India. In India, you, you can't hide much. Everything is out in the open. The number of people who die are counted, unlike in China, where they say the crematoriums were so full during the initial phase of the pandemic, they completely lost count. That is one reason. Second reason is because they knew that the virus had arisen much, much earlier than the rest of the world. They knew it much earlier and they didn't let the world know, which is the, the, the honest truth. And they, being a, an authoritarian country, can use draconian measures. In fact, people were hauled out of their homes and literally imprisoned because they had COVID. You can't do that in a democratic society like India. So these are the reasons, I think, which people have already mentioned, the reason why it probably didn't spread. They could confine the epidemic to Wuhan. They didn't let it spread beyond it. And they, of course, uh, exported it to the rest of the world. And it is uh, going on in most other parts of the world, including our country. Sir, but uh, at the same time, there are some uh, positive aspects in their preventive strategies as well. So what they did is, like uh, 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 as Rao sir was mentioning, so they have completely uh, sealed down the initial cities and uh, they didn't uh, let any person to go out from that area. Instead, they mobilized the health resources from all other parts of the country. Even we have seen that the health workers uh, like voluntarily going to that area, they built separate hospitals in that area. And they uh, like uh, 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 restricted the tre treatment in that area alone. And they have opened that area only after the disease was contained. I don't know whether it is contained, completely contained or not. Only uh, uh, after containing, they have opened that. Instead, in India or in other countries, what we did, like we had initial outbreak in uh, uh, Mumbai, like almost uh, four weeks, five weeks, we were uh, in shutdown. And uh, finally, we opened up and uh, uh, allowed the people to move all around the country. And later on, they infected all other parts. It's not the Mumbai only, all other cities initially got infected. The people started moving to all other areas. And in fact, we didn't uh, uh, mobilize the resources from other parts of the country to that initial uh, areas where it was affected. I think that is one of the other, uh, one of the reasons why we couldn't uh, control uh, as effectively as uh, China did. Again, uh, 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 my personal opinion, I don't know how uh, truth it is. Yeah, that's what the best opinion we, we want. The reason why I am again coming on to the point is that yeah, on March 23rd, we are clamping the lockdown. Well, that lockdown continued for nearly seven weeks together. Well, honestly speaking, this much of clamping, I don't think it would have happened in Wuhan even, in China even. But I'm, well, even with this clamping, well, I doubt whether it was so successful a lockdown when people were still moving around or people were taking around the disease to others. Anyway, some sort of failure happened somewhere. Anyway, it is for somebody else to discuss on this particular matter. We don't want to. Now, the question is that, thank you, Anu, for discussing the line dynamics which is going on. And you say the car positioning, I mean, the car management, that's the standard management these days? The car... Yes, sir. It is, uh, all, all the centers are uh, uh, following the same protocol, sir. The, the ah, right. following uh, the different positions. Even without intubation of the line, air, without accessing the airway, well, we, with the yeah, high-flight or uh, 
a navy or yeah, any or anything of that aspect. sort. Right? Yeah. Maybe uh, the tolerance in all these positions are not that good at HFNC, but uh, patient tolerates to very well. And uh, even in oxygen, uh, uh, like either nasal cannula or NRBM also, patient tolerates that. And as I've already told, there are some group of patients who really respond to uh, this awake poly. Yeah. Joe, sir, uh, you want to add something, sir? Yeah, awake proning is done all over the world now. It is a oh. standard modality to improve oxygenation. Uh, through several mechanisms. The most uh, important mechanism is that the dorsum of the lung has much more lung mass than the ventral part of the lung. Yeah. So when you turn prone, more lung is open to recruitment, one. And secondly, the weight of the heart is taken away to the greater proportion of the lung when you lie prone. So that is the, in fact, it's a more physiological position of uh, lying uh, down to improve your gas exchange. And that has been shown to be very effective in improving saturation in all types of situations, not only in patients with uh, COVID-19, in other patients with severe hypoxemia as well, as there are several studies that actually best testimony to that. So, so it's a standard technique that is commonly employed. You can use it in combination with high flow nasal oxygen and at times with NIV as well. But as we very uh, importantly, we uh, pointed out it is very important not to delay intubation and resort to continued NIV use or high flow nasal cannula use in patients who are getting more breathless with vigorous spontaneous efforts. They develop uh, self inflicted lung injury over time, which will go on to a phase wherein it reaches a stage of no comeback. Could you dilate that particular term, self inflicted lung injury? Yes. Yeah, what happens is when you are breathing spontaneously, if you take a vigorous inspiratory effort, the transpulmonary pressure becomes very high. Transpulmonary pressure is pleural pressure minus airway pressure. So when you take a deep inspiratory effort, the pleural pressure rise becomes extremely negative, and that makes the transpulmonary pressure very high. And it is actually the transpulmonary pressure that decides the degree of stress to the lung. Lung stress is directly proportional to the transpulmonary pressure. It is much worse to let a dyspneic patient continue to take forceful inspiratory efforts than to intubate, paralyze, and use control ventilation. This has been shown time and again. So somebody who has a minimal parenchymal injury to begin with, who has some degree of hypoxia, may, if you persist with NIV or high flow too long and let them breathe with very vigorous spontaneous efforts, as happens in some cases, they can cause the injury to be much worse and, and classically give you the picture of self-inflicted lung injury. Uh, it is not a new concept by any means. It has been described several years ago. And we see it today glaringly in front of our own eyes in patients with COVID-19. So, so the most important point here is that patients who have vigorous inspiratory efforts should not be allowed to continue to do so on NIV or high flow. You give them a, a brief period of time on NIV. If they do not improve their respiratory mechanics in that period of time, it is much safer to put the tube down and use control ventilation rather than let them breathe spontaneously. This is in fact true with patients who are intubated, ventilated as well, especially when you try to wean, when you try to wean them on pressure support. Again, if they have vigorous efforts, that again can lead to further damage to the lung. So it's very important to have a good person by the bedside to evaluate the patient over time and assess the requirement for intubation first, and even among ventilated patients to assess the timing of weaning and how long do you persist with uh, weaning? Does your patient need to go back on full ventilator support when they are being weaned? So all these questions need expert bedside care, which unfortunately is not a very easy commodity to get in the face of a pandemic like this. Uh, but that essentially is the concept of self-inflicted lung injury, which can cause severe damage if you let let it go on. Right, Josh. Then this silly now I believe is another form of Ali or acute lung injury. Yes, yes. And uh, 
well you say the standard protocol now followed all over the world is to intubate early and what is a guess to say that the patient is not improving and the silly is progressing that's a very not a very easy question to answer that's where expertise and experience come into play there are some objective parameters to decide whether your patient is breathing too hard uh, like anup has mentioned there are some studies uh, coming up rock score and many other score uh, scoring systems as well which might be a more objective piece of evidence but essentially if you are by the bed side what we have learned from our own experience is that you apply niv or high flow or any other form of respiratory support for a reasonable period of time as in say 4 to 6 hours and you shouldn't just go by saturation saturation is not the be all and end all of all end points you look closely at the patient effort if the patient effort does not diminish and with the ease of breathing does it improve regardless of the saturation that is when you would consider intubation and by intubation i don't mean early as in rush in and intubate anybody with a saturation of say less than 90% that's not what i mean you primarily look at the respiratory mechanics mechanics as in the respiratory rate the degree of inspiratory effort the use of accessory muscle and the general level of comfort which is most important as i mentioned there are no hardcore simple rules to go by but bedside experience really means a lot in this situation good uh one more question to jos well vaccine is being tried at your next door building i think there is some progress going on there do you know anything more about the vaccine trials yeah, not in bangalore jss mysore is part of the Uh, part of the oxford vaccine trial yeah that's why right. nestorly i said yes. that yeah. not in your institution uh, yeah. i'm not aware of the details any no first hand information on those i don't have any first hand information i have the information that they have temporarily suspended the trial because of an adverse yeah. event yeah uh, hopefully it won't be for long they will carry on with their trial yeah moderators please take our moderators with other questions this is a uh, dot commissioner so regarding uh, one uh, steroids uh, many people are having uh, doubts uh, regarding what steroid is better dexamethasone or uh, prednisolone or methylprednisolone and at what time to start uh, some people are saying that in first week because there is viremia it is not advisable to give the steroid and uh, it is ideal to start in second week and some are of the opinion it should be started on the first day of symptoms itself to prevent the lung progression of uh, the damage and all these things so what is your uh, experience and what is your suggestion on this matter well we have pretty strong evidence from the recovery study in which they used a very modest dose of dexamethasone 6 mg per day iv and they gave this for a period of a week and they they showed significantly improved survival among dexamethasone treated patients in a very modest dose of 6 mg as to whether a higher dose will be more effective is uh, questionable but i think we have to rely by the evidence that we have in hand i know there are many people who use methyl pred and that too in industrial doses like pulse doses like bd dose of 1 mg per kg all this in my in my personal view may not be the appropriate dosing because we have very good evidence from from sars infection from mers infection as well that methylprednisolone in such high doses can actually increase mortality and also other adverse events so that may not be the way to go my own personal view is that we should stick to the recovery findings and use the low dose dexamethasone protocol they followed as in 6 mg per day because dexamethasone has a long half life once daily dosing is enough and you don't need to wean or taper the dose you can stop it at the end of the one week period so that's what i would go by high doses of methylprednisolone particularly 
may be harmful, especially in that it might lead to bacterial infections, which is very common. We have seen many patients who do well initially, especially in the elderly group, who seem to do okay in the first couple of weeks. They go to the ward and then they come back with bad bacterial infection and they die. So one of the reasons may be the use of methylprednisolone and perhaps the use of cytokine inhibitors like the like tocilizumab and nitrolizumab may also, even if they are not useful, they may indeed be harmful in resulting in a higher incidence of bacterial infection. So for the moment, I would stick to dexamethasone in the dose that the recovery study used. I would, uh, of course, uh, be open to opinion from others as well in, in regarding their experience as well as what they feel. You suggest it uh, the moment you observe the lung changes uh, in the CT or uh, when the saturations are coming down? Yeah, only if they don't maintain saturation. We don't use it if they're able to maintain saturation, regardless of the CT finding. In fact, the other day, I had one of my colleagues actually who had very distinctive consolidation uh, on the CT scan, but saturation was uh, 96, 98% on air, and she never required oxygen, and we never gave her steroid, and she recovered within a matter of uh, three to four days, was uh, febrile and went home. So in that sort of patient, regardless of the CT finding, you wouldn't use, but recovery study, what it particularly highlighted was the fact that dexamethasone is more useful among patients, first, those who need oxygen, and second, Particularly those who are on mechanical yeah, ventilation. Yes, sir. Proceed, sir. Yeah. Proceed, sir. Yeah, yes. Uh, well, I was not audible, I suppose. Yeah, so, you are audible, sir. Yes. No. Now you are audible. Sir. Yeah, dexamethasone, uh, we would use in patients who are hypoxic, and, and if they're not hypoxic, regardless of the CT findings, we wouldn't use. Second, the efficacy of dexamethasone seems to be related to the requirement for oxygen, and secondly, to the requirement for intubated, ventilated patients. Its efficacy seems to be more in patients who require mechanical ventilation, and relatively less in patients who require oxygen alone. And on in patients who are not on oxygen, who do not require oxygen, it is not useful. And paradoxically, there was a, a signal that it may cause harm in the recovery study. So, so the indication currently is to use it only in patients who require supplemental oxygen or who are on mechanical ventilation. Just in continuity, uh, for how long would you like to uh, administer steroids to the patient? Or what one, week, one, week. One? one week, one week. One week is uh, just one week. week. Yes. Even if the patient's saturation and uh, you know parameters are not maintained, you would hesitate to continue beyond a week, generally speaking, because as you prolong the duration of treatment, the possibility of complications like bacterial sepsis may become higher. And the evidence we have today is only for a uh, for a week. So generally speaking, we don't continue for more than a week. I know uh, there are many physicians, in fact, who use methylpred. If you if you're looking at an equivalent dose of methylpred, the dose will be only, I think it'll be only 20 milligrams of methylpred, corresponding to six milligrams of dexamethasone. So higher doses would not be the way to go, and longer duration also may not be the way to go. Thank you. That there is some great. schools of thought that methylprednisolone has got a better lung penetration than dexamethasone. But how far it is true, I don't know. Yeah, as I mentioned, there have been many studies with methylpred, not in COVID-19, in SARS and MERS, which are very similar infections. And uh, I know of a, you know, particularly a study in MERS, which showed substantially more mortality in patients who are treated with methylprednisolone. So that's why Although given it's uh, the physiological rationale, you wouldn't rush in with methylpred in these patients, given that we have fairly strong evidence with dexamethasone. I think, uh, in my opinion, we should go by that evidence at this point of time. 
Okay, sir. Thank you very much. Very good clarity. And regarding remdesivir, some people advise only when the oxygen saturation start falling. At that time, if you give remdesivir, it will be of benefit rather than giving it too early. What is your uh, opinion, sir? I'm not sure about remdesivir, whether you should wait for oxygen saturation to drop. In fact, uh, the study, there are three randomized controlled studies and uh, I think the bottom line of all these studies is that if you use it after seven to 10 days, it may not be efficacious. Of course, in mild disease, you wouldn't use it at all in patients who just have, say, fever and no other symptoms or mild symptoms, you wouldn't want to use it. And uh, in patients who have more severe symptoms or prolonged duration of symptoms, and of course, if they have lung involvement as in breathing difficulty or drop in saturation, of course, you would consider using it. But again, most of the antiviral medications, as I know pointed out, you need to use within the period of viral replication, otherwise they won't be beneficial. So too late will also not be efficacious. So you need to be choosy here. It's a little difficult to decide as to who would actually benefit. And the question also remains whether it will cause harm if you use later in the disease. So you need to balance all this. And generally speaking, patients with mild symptoms, we wouldn't use it. Basically, it is said as virus said retracted. Then how it will be harming in the later phases? Because, you know, renal dysfunction, hepatic dysfunction, these are all well-described adverse effects with remdesivir. And I must also point out here that from the randomized controls that we have so far, there are two large randomized control trials and one from China. The two big studies, they have actually not shown a survival benefit. All they could show was an earlier resolution of symptoms, which of course was based on an objective scale, that is true. But symptom resolution is perhaps, you would argue, may not be the, the most reliable parameter to go by. And survival would be a much better parameter, which is what we all want. We want a, an improved survival with whatever intervention. A reduction in hospital days by say two or three days may not matter all that much, particularly considering the fact that remdesivir is by no means a cheap drug. It comes with a cost and staying in hospital longer may not matter all that much. So, so from what we have so far, no study has shown improved survival with remdesivir. I would, of course, uh, seek the opinion of others as well in this regard. It has only shown earlier symptomatic improvement and earlier discharge. Discharge from hospital, again, is by no means an objective criterion. You can discharge your patients early, and uh, especially if it's not a blinded study. So all these things have sort of mixed uh, conclusions, and I think... Uh, you should be aware of the possibility that the effect may not be uniform across the board and uh, not only may it not be effective, it might actually be harmful if you overdo it like with any other drug. Thank you, sir. Dr. Anup, what is your opinion on this? I totally agree with uh, Josa's opinion. Uh, yes, uh, clearly I mentioned that for the use. And again, and, uh, in mild patients, uh, mm. there is no point in starting all these antivirals. They will recover uh, without any treatment. So basically, what you have is only symptomatic treatment. That's what I am supposed to believe by now. Except for dexamethasone, yeah. there is no strong evidence that any of these treatment modalities work. Neither remdesivir and uh, from whatever we have seen and from whatever has been published in literature on convalescent plasma, the results have been equivocal. In, in our own personal experience, it has been fairly disappointing. We haven't seen among the several patients we've treated with convalescent plasma, we've not seen a single case of dramatic improvement with the use of plasma. 
I have several patients actually. It's it's uh, we are actually in Bangalore, Bowring and Victoria hospitals are part of the study as well. Even there, we haven't seen any kind of dramatic effect. Many of these patients have actually gone on to deteriorate over time. I'm not saying I'm not pointing fin fingers at the treatment part itself. They may have deteriorated naturally. But as I mentioned, the thing that stands out is the fact that we haven't seen anybody improve dramatically with plasma. And as Anup mentioned, the initial ICMR reports also suggest that it may not be effective across the board. There may be subgroups of patients, but we are not sure as to who will respond. Another question, sir. A COVID positive patient who recovered became negative. And uh, at what time he can be subjected for any surgery, elective or any surgery? That is a question from audience. Okay, if you are COVID negative, that depends, I suppose, on the situation, how urgent the surgery has to be done. If it is something that can wait, because one of the problems that we see, most of these patients who have COVID, many of them are in the older age group. And even after they recover, there is a very long haul to getting back to anything like normal. They have severe muscle weakness. They lose their nutritional status. They lose their mobility. And several complications are possible if you subject them to the stress of surgery soon afterwards. So unless it is something that needs to be done in a fairly expedited manner, I would strongly suggest to wait for a few weeks till they get back to somewhere back to their normal level of health before you embark upon any major surgical procedure, unless it is urgent. That is my own feeling. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. There are a few more questions uh, in the uh, question box. Uh, this is about how do you explain pulmonary fibrosis in patients who survive COVID? Lung fibrosis is uh, fairly common after most types of acute respiratory distress syndrome. The longer it takes to heal, the more likely the incidence of fibrosis. And we've already started seeing fibrotic changes in many of our patients. In fact, currently we have something like four patients on ventilation for about four weeks or more in our ICU with fibrotic changes. And and I must admit that none of them have gotten to the point of going home yet. One of these patients is still on a tracheostomy, but off ventilator. Three of them are still struggling on the ventilator. So it is reasonably common, as common as you would expect in other types of IRDS, especially in patients who have severe disease and who take a long time to recover. Okay. Uh, another question that is for Dr. Anu. How much oxygen flows uh, to give on high flow nasal oxygen? Uh, that again depends, sir. Usually, we uh, the flow the you increase that will give you more uh, peep effect. So usually, in in like acute uh, hypoxemic uh, failure or in ARDS, when you start uh, uh, high flow oxygen, you always tend to keep the flow slightly on the higher side. Usually okay. between forty to sixty liters. But when you go with a very high flow, like uh, 60 liters and all, the chance of aerosol generation also will be high. So depending on the situation, you can uh, optimize. Something uh, 40 liters plus will be okay, I feel. Okay. Uh, the next that I can see there is that, is an aerosol box must for intubation in a COVID-19 patient? Uh, usually in the ICU, like if you are uh, uh, intubating and uh, if you are used with the uh, uh, boxes, sometimes it's very difficult to uh, intubate with the boxes. I think uh, many centers are uh, using that intubation box. And as I've already mentioned, these all aerosol generating procedure, if possible, better to do in a uh, negative pressure room. Okay. Uh, one question, I don't know if it's uh, within the preview of uh, this uh, present talk or not. Now, uh, is this a biological weapon? Well. <laughs> You know, the question is there in the box, so that's how I've uh, floated it up. We are not supposed yeah, to comment like on this, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but you had a laugh, so I don't know if you would like to respond to that. It's slightly weird, thus in answering the question. <laughs> okay, all right. Now, uh, another is, is peak is now coming up, and uh, when we expect it to flatten? 
that mm -hmm. again is a little outside the preview of uh, the presentation. But in, if one of you can answer, I'll. Uh, we'll That's with it. Well, we all say out here, this is only the second wave we started. It. There is yet another wave, the third wave. Probably the third wave is the one which is going to happen, say, some middle of normal or waves. And probably with the third wave, around 25 to 30 percent of people will have immunity. And well, the disease may start disappearing from our midst. That's a feeling what we have here. Okay. All, all the predictions about uh, curve flattening in India has gone wrong so far. Yeah, correct. Yeah. <laughs> and I think yeah. uh, it is quite likely that in the future too, all such predictions will come untrue. Latest they are waiting for 15 September. There was a prediction about 15 September. As well. <laughs> what, what is that prediction? <laughs> that is wishful that is thinking. Really even oh, astrological also. Yes. Okay. Another question that we have is kindly explain pre-test probability in interpreting COVID test results. So that is like if you have a high clinical suspicion that the patient is positive, like the patient is having a strong contact or the clinical features and the other uh, uh, features are more in favor of a COVID and you don't have an alternate uh, diagnosis. In that case, your pre-test probability is very high. And even if you do a test and if it is coming uh, uh, like uh, negative, so that is a case where you can go with uh, uh, like a radiological uh, like a imaging or a CT thorax to see whether there is any evidence of uh, COVID-19. Because sometimes it is possible that you can have a repeat PCR is also negative in COVID patients. We have seen cases like that as well. Sometimes in that group of patients, if you combine uh, these PCR with the antibody test, you can get an antibody positivity. Okay. If uh, you look through the results, which are being published at the state level, as well as at the national level, well, one can very clearly say 8 to 9% of the tests done turns out positive. In that particular event, is there any point in increasing the number of tests unless it is warranted? We want to know somebody whether positive or not. Okay, you do a test. But for only for statistical correlation, do we need such a large number to be tested? Uh, there are two arguments for that, sir. Uh, like yeah. even though CDC, uh, uh, they have stated uh, that you don't have to uh, test more on uh, uh, asymptomatic patient. Even later, they are forced to uh, uh, change that statement. Even uh, IDSA, WHO, no other bodies have supported that because the more you test, obviously, the more you can isolate and you can prevent the spread. But uh, obviously, once you go for a complete community outbreak, whether you are going to uh, gain much by doing extensive testing, uh, still uh, debatable, but I think at this uh, uh, at this point of time, especially in the uh, Indian scenario or Kerala scenario, I, I still feel that there is a significant role in uh, increasing the number of tests and uh, isolating these people early. Yes, that's what I'm saying, sir. Because repeated analysis of the tests done and the percentage turned out positive is around eight to nine percent of the tested population. 89% of the test population are between positive. So it has come to a conclusion that less than 10%, never beyond 10%, less than 10% of patients who are tested become positive. In that case, why can't we draw a conclusion that around that much percentage, say 8 or 9 or say maximum 10% of people are infected? Can we come to that conclusion? No, you can't. No, sir, it's very, very, very difficult because, because there are so many variables in that. Yes. And you are testing, Please. when you do testing, you test on a susceptible community, not across the board, isn't it? Correct. Uh, so yeah, naturally, correct. your pickup rate will be high. If you do across the board, it will be much, much lower. And uh, it, may, it may not be a true reflection. You cannot assume that because <laughs> it is 8%, it is 8% oh, out of what you've tested. It will be 8% in the community. No, that's not true. It will be much, much lower in the community. Very much less. Like yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 
uh, we're coming back to uh, the same uh, chat box. Uh, Dr. Noob, what is the incidence of infections to healthcare workers looking after high flow nasal cannula patients? Uh, I've not uh, seen any such data, sir. Like, uh, uh, unfortunately, in my unit, uh, no one has got infected only because of uh, using high flow nasal cannula. That is, that is what I can say. Uh, but I've not seen any studies where this high flow nasal cannula was causing more uh, infections. Joe, sir, uh, you have any experience in that? No, I don't have any experience at all. But uh, what I would uh, recommend strongly, <clears throat> one is you wear a proper N95 mask. By proper, I mean there are several masks that are being touted and, and being used in the among healthcare workers, which is supposedly N95, but many of them, especially in the early uh, stage of this pandemic, whatever we got, was not really up to the mark, I feel. And I have a strong feeling that at least some of the healthcare workers got infected because of that. That's one. Secondly, the use of a, a goggle versus face shield. If you use a face shield alone, it is a splatter protection, that is true, but it does not protect your eyes against aerosols. The, in fact, the aerosol exposure may be higher if you use a face shield without, without using goggles because there is what's called a chimney effect wherein the aerosol rises up through the face shield because the hot air that you breathe out rises up and the infected aerosol rises up along the face shield and it can contaminate your eye. So that is a, a major concern, al although there is no strong evidence to suggest that. But when you're wearing a face shield, I think more important than face shield, you should wear goggles with the side cover. And on top of that, you should probably wear a face shield. And I think if you do this, the possibility of exposure can be kept down to a minimum with a, any type of aerosol, including with uh, high flow nasal cannula or NIV or other such aerosol generating procedures. But sir, uh, there was an Indian paper in JAMA which uh, they were saying the face shield was superior to goggles. That I, I, know, I like haven't cloud. seen that paper, but it cannot be true. On a, there are several uh, experimental studies that have been done with this. People who have done studies with artificial aerosols and things. And it is consistently shown that if you wear a face shield without goggles, this chimney effect does happen because expired air moves out and the fresh air, which is filled with aerosol, in fact, rises up. I think that is fairly good evidence to suggest that it may risk exposure to your eyes. It is not meant to protect you against aerosols anyway. The face shield is meant to protect only against splatter. Like when you do a procedure, you have, uh, let's say, suctioning, secretions, tracheostomy, and so on. But uh, goggles will protect you against aerosols because the sides are also covered. I think that uh, appears quite logical. Uh, the chimney effect uh, that you explained, I think uh, that, that's something new, uh, at least new to me. Uh, Dr. Anu, uh, you had mentioned earlier that you see that there is a high infectivity potential from patients who are still not, not, not uh, symptomatic. I mean, two to three days before the symptoms appear, there's a very high infective uh, potential. Now, what can be done to, uh, to, to prevent, that, uh, prevent the spread of infection in this, in this period? That's why, sir, we will have Taking to... routine uh, measures on yeah, routine measures like universal masking and uh, distancing for everyone because these persons will be completely asymptomatic. You may not be able to find this pre-symptomatic group at all. That is a major challenge we are having in uh, uh, like reducing the numbers or reducing the transmission of COVID-19. So I think, we will have uh, to... Yeah, but please go on. We will have to go with this universal masking that uh, source control basically. So that is the only way we can prevent that. I think uh, apart from the mask that we uh, say N95 and N95C, uh, we uh, say day in and day out, it's the technique with which they put the mask on as well. 
there are a lot of flaws with the wearing of the mask. Now, if there's a space here where the breath is going in and out of uh, the mask, so I think uh, it doesn't really uh, hold good because in any case, the air is getting in into your pulmonary system without getting filtered uh, through, the, uh, through the mask. So uh, I've seen some people, they would either pull it down or up in a way that they can breathe easy. Well, I think that that's where the harm actually occurs. And then there are some masks which are quite commonly available in the market with the exhalation port. I think that again is very, very harmful because whatever the patient exhales, that comes out uh, to all the people who are around that uh, patient. So that uh, again is quite uh, you know harmful, uh, I believe. Your, your take on that? You're absolutely correct, sir. Same. Okay, any more questions? Uh, if I can see in the chat box, I don't see any question which has been, uh, which has not been answered. Most of the questions uh, in some form or the other have been answered. Uh, uh, Dr. Kamesh Rao, would you like to say uh, anything uh, you know, with regard to the questions? Sir, regarding the questions, you have covered almost uh, all the questions, sir. Yeah. And uh, both the speakers uh, uh, really, very clearly highlight the pathophysiology aspects and also the treatment aspects. Uh, very wonderful lecture during this COVID time. Very beneficial for all the speak uh, delegates who attended this uh, webinar. Now over to Dr. Radha Krishna, sir. Thank you, Dr. Kamesher, Dr. Belgit, Dr. Jose, and Anu. Thank you very much for being with us and explaining this particular topic very nicely so that anybody can understand and very probably we can plan up for our future. Once again, colleague thanks you for your immense support. I'm looking forward to see you all in the successive webinars. Sanish, shall we sign off? Yes, sir. Uh, we Thank had a good session today yep. uh, yes. with a lot of interactive discussion. Dr. Jay is somewhere. Yes, sir, yes please. I am there. Please, I'm please, there. please come in. Please come in. Uh, yeah. So yeah. That was an excellent uh, seminar, which is very well timed. This is the time we all need to know as much as possible about the COVID. And uh, these lectures have really helped us in uh, modifying our management and really coming to know more. And so also the students, the pathophysiology, etc. was so well covered. And thanks a lot to both of you. Thank you very much. Superb lectures. And... Uh, um, thanks. And I think uh, Dr. Sunish can wind it up. Yes, sir. Um, uh, next week, we'll be having webinar on cardiac anesthesia topic. The topics I have already displayed. And uh, the week next to that, we'll have the module two of mechanical ventilation with uh, Dr. T. R. Chandrasekhar. Right. Other questions, sir? We can conclude. Yes, we can. Thank, thank you. Thank That's you. Nice. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, everyone. Nice. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Bye-bye.